I am really, really grateful for our speaker today, um, Jennifer Tanoa, who is a pharmacist based over at the Seattle VA. I um, invited her to give this talk because I heard a longer version of it and was just blown away um, by how much I learned in a relatively brief amount of time. Um, so I'm grateful that you've come to give us the shorter version of this talk, um, you know, really focused on what we need to know uh, to take care of older adults in the primary care setting, and I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. So today, um, I, you know, I definitely try to take a 45-minute presentation and just kind of get down to the, you know, what you need to know to feel comfortable um, when you're seeing a geriatric patient um, and treating their diabetes. We're going to focus today more on the relatively newer agents um, because, you know, we're using them a lot more often and a lot of, they're great, they have a lot of great benefits, but the risks um, that are associated with them, we just need to know, we need to focus on, on them more for our geriatric geriatric population just because they can lead to more harmful consequences. So uh, my goal, like I said, for today is to, um, we'll chat a little bit also about what goes into developing a treatment goal for your patient um, based off of what current guideline recommendations are available. Um, but like I said, mostly we're going to be really looking with our geriatric lens, the benefits and risks of the newer antihyperglycemic drug classes for our patient population. So to start, um, typically, I mean, I, I was a I was in geriatric pharmacy previously for the past two years, and what I found was it can just be so complicated to treat diabetes in this population because there's so many factors that you have to consider, right? You have to consider um, frailty, cognition, um, social determinants of health, just so many things and additional things you may not have to consider in a younger patient population. So to kind of provide myself a framework and how I try to approach each patient, this is kind of what I go by. So one, I'm trying to individualize the care based Based on that specific patient's goals. So based on their health status and their wants and needs and desires, are we going for disease control or are we going for more of just symptom management and kind of like more of a palliative care approach? And what is the overall quality of life that we're trying to obtain or sustain? So really trying to focus in on this specific patient in front of me, you know, what am I trying to accomplish here? And then using shared decision-making, getting their buy-in, um, learning more about what, again, their goals are so that that can help tailor what medications I might be thinking of and learning from them about their day-to-day, -day, how feasible are some of these medications going to be? Um, and lastly, uh, this third pillar, just avoiding overtreatment. Um, hypoglycemia becomes very dangerous, especially in our population. It leads to a whole bunch of negative consequences. And that's something that we're really trying to avoid. I also want to avoid treatment burden. So some of our folks, you know, they need four or five drugs to even control symptoms. So it makes, makes managing diabetes difficult, but also looking overall at the medication list, how much of these medications are contributing to the overall polypharmacy treatment burden. So some things to keep in mind, just kind of like a framework when you uh, see different patients. Uh, for treatment goals, and these are all treatment goals in assessing um, patients with diabetes if they're 65 years and older. So we have the newest guideline, uh, which is the American Diabetes Association for the 2023. Um, AGS, American Geriatric Society, also had um, some recommendations. And ES, uh, Endocrine Society in 2019, they also have kind of like their own guideline for older adults for treating diabetes. Um, not going to go too much into detail, just wanted to show you that the goals based off of the patient's characteristics are pretty similar um, and how you might try to assess, you know, what health status or category that patient falls into. Again, it's based off of the subjective and objective data you obtain, um, such as how, how many concomitant chronic conditions are they dealing with? What is their functional and cognitive status? Um, do, do they have an end-stage chronic illness? Um, most of the time, most people fall into the complex or intermediate health category. So this box um, in purple, and um, there's kind of some good cons consistency with what the goal would be. Um, but that being said, you know, if I have a patient, for example, who does have mild cognitive impairment, 
but they have an end stage chronic illness, then I would go based off of the higher severity. Um, so I would be more, um, I would probably approach them, uh, assess them as a very complex or poor health status patient. And what I always like to highlight is when we get to this, this patient category, we're really not recommending an A1C goal anymore, just based off of there's just no good data to suggest that's even beneficial, but we do have data to suggest that goals are harmful. Um, and so we're not really going to shoot for an A1C goal. Instead, we're just gonna do the bare minimum, which is avoiding lows, because we know that's really, really bad, and avoiding symptomatic hyperglycemia, because that's going to impair quality of life. So being super tired all the time, being really, really thirsty, having to pee all the time. Um, and then also consequences of hyperglycemia, hospitalizations for DKA or HHS, um, delayed wound healing. So that's more of what we're trying to accomplish rather than I need to get your A1C below this percentage. Um, so this is yeah something I just like to highlight, but like I said, most often folks will kind of fall in the complex intermediate health category. All right, so we're gonna take a dive into the, the drugs. Um, I'm not really going to explain this table. This is for completeness sake. This is for your um, reference. So the ADA 2023 um, standards of care have, they, it has a beautiful table of all the drug classes um, and they include the same information. So how efficacious is this drug class? Is there a hypoglycemia glycemia risk? What does this do to weight? Um, and are there benefits in chronic kidney disease, uh, heart disease, or heart failure? So the things in red, I just wanted to quickly highlight. Um, metformin, I mean, we're all kind of familiar with metformin that, you know, it's it used to be our standard first-line therapy. Now it's not really the case anymore. Now it's really, we're going to go based off of what um, conditions exist for the patient and also cost. But um, I tend to try to use metformin if I can. There's just two patient populations that I just kind of can't. Um, one is if they've had really bad diarrhea in the past with it, and they're like, no way, Jose, you're not starting this. I, there's no way I'm gonna restart metformin, and that's it, like, that's fair. Um, and then also for my patients who have uh, renal impairment, so if their EGFR is less than 30, I just can't start it. So try to use metformin unless they fall into one of those buckets. The, these three, sulfonylureas, um, TZDs, and insulin, you know, overall, we really just try to avoid using these agents um, for sulfonylureas and insulin, mainly because of the hypoglycemia risk. Um, and then for TZDs, just a lot of our patients have, you know, heart failure or risks, risk factors for heart failure. And so the, the edema that comes with TZDs just spells danger for a lot of folks. Um, and so we tend, we try not to use those three agents unless we absolutely have to. The main, um, the main reason you might use a sulfonylurea or a TZD is just because they're really, really cheap, just like metformin. Um, so they're almost always either going to be covered by insurance or they're on, you know, like the $4 list. So that's kind of the only reason. Okay, so this is where we're gonna focus the rest of our time. Um, we're gonna talk about sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors or SGLT2s, um, eyes. And we're gonna talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on the dual glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide and GLP-1 receptor agonists or terzepatide Monjaro, just because there's, there's still, it's, it's super new um, and there's still data in uh, pending for the extra benefits. Um, and so yeah, we're going to focus more on GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then we'll just kind of touch a little bit about DPP-4 inhibitors, um, where, you know, focusing on role in therapy and such. So we'll take a deep, deeper dive into these three uh, classes in purple. All right, so SGLT2 inhibitors, um, that's your empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, canagliflozin. These drugs um, work in your proximal tubule to um, inhibit glucose reuptake. So that lowers the threshold for, um, for glucose reabsorption or excretion, excuse me. And so you're just, the, you're just peeing out more sugar. That's what I tell my patients. This drug is gonna make you pee out sugar. Um, and the benefits include, you know, we don't have to really worry about hypoglycemia risk if, 
monotherapy. Um, it does promote some weight loss because you're peeing sugar, which means you're peeing out some calories. So depending on, you know, your caloric intake, um, that could produce a modest weight loss. Um, a couple of them have shown benefit for folks with cardiovascular disease or uh, at risk for CVD and um, also reduces the risk of chronic kidney disease progression. All of them reduce the risk for hospitalization for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then empagliflozin or Dardians is the brand name. This has been, you know, kind of like, this was like a blockbuster study that showed that empagliflozin reduces the risk of hospitalization for HEF-PEF or preserved ejection fraction. So we're actually even now trying to promote this information because some people may not be aware that empagliflozin can do all of these things, um, even in HEF-PEF and, and in that study, folks didn't even have diabetes. So we're starting to see SGLT2 inhibitors prescribed uh, a lot. So they're great medications, um, but there are risks obviously associated with them. And I wanted to highlight this because I really, really think hard about these risks when I'm assessing a patient. So I said they make you pee sugar, right? Um, that can increase urinary frequency, which a lot of our patients already have baseline urinary frequency or they're incontinent. Um, it can also lead to hypotension or dehydration. That has been shown SGLT2 inhibitors as a whole, they, there is a higher incidence of volume depletion in our older adults. So one of the clinical pearls is to try to assess volume status and correct for any hypovolemia if it exists um, at baseline. So that's gonna be probably more pertinent for your folks with heart failure. Um, and if they're on a diuretic, especially like a loop and maybe they're euvolemic or maybe a little bit more on the drier side, can consider reducing the dose of the diuretic to kind of make room for the SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, so I would say this, yeah, this is always on the forefront. Do they already have to pee a lot? Are they dizzy already? Um, and do they just, are they just not great at drinking enough water? Or are they just really diuresed? Um, genital urinary infections, you know, the way I explain this is we all have like bacteria that live on our skin, especially in our general area. Um, and sugar is the fuel uh, for bacteria. And so the bad bacteria just oh, outgrows the good ones and then we get an infection. So um, we do recommend to promote, you know, counsel for good hygiene. Um, but, you know, we have to really think about, okay, some of my patients are wearing Depends all day. Um, some of my patients have a history of recurrent infections and even like, uh, what's it called? Like very resistant infections. And so in those patients who already have an established history, I would just avoid this altogether because um, I actually have had people develop urosepsis because of um, this class. So, you know, if they, like I said, have a history of recurrent infections and that goes for UTIs or yeast um, infections, really weigh that risk against the benefits in that patient. Um, and then if a patient does develop an infection, the the standard practice is to stop it or hold it, um, treat the infection, and then come back and really consider the risks. You know, is it worth restarting this medication, potentially getting another infection based off the benefits that you may derive? Um, in real clinical practice, I would say nine out of 10 times, my patient is like, nope, we're not doing that again. And I'm like, fair. So um, again, it's going to be patient specific. Some of them are like, you know what, this is going to keep me out of the hospital. So yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather take it. It really just depends, have that open conversation. Um, and then diabetic ketoacidosis or euglycemic DKA. If you have a patient who's a huge fan of keto, which if they have diabetes, like already, already know, but if they are a huge fan of keto, um, they're already trying to get a state into a state of ketosis, which is just going to make this worse. So the idea is that, you know, this is making you lose your uh, glucose reserve. And so your body is shifting from using sugar as an energy source to fat, that lipolysis as a byproduct promotes ketones into the blood. So I, I don't necessarily ask, you know, right off the bat, are you on a keto diet? You just kind of get a sense of it when you ask them, like, what did you eat for dinner last night? Or what did you eat yesterday? And they kind of tell you. Um, or folks who just, you know, they're not hungry all the time. They have a really poor appetite. 
they're not eating a lot, you know, maybe my folks who are on chemo and they just are, they just feel sick all the time. Um, it's kind of the same thought process. You're not getting enough carbohydrates and potentially this is not going to be a good option. Um, and in folks who have had ketoacidosis already, I just stay clear of it because that could be potentially fatal. So um, things to keep in mind. Uh, and then just briefly about GLP-1s. Um, so these are Again, blockbuster, oh, excuse me, blockbuster class, they work super well in reducing A1C because they work at different sites. Um, we're reducing glucagon secretion, we're improving insulin secretion, and we're slowing gastric emptying. And so we do see more significant weight loss with this category of, of drugs compared to like the SGLT2 inhibitors. We see the same benefit for cardiovascular disease. Um, some of them also have benefits for CKD, more from a uh, albuminuria standpoint, but that benefit still exists. Um, but because they, one of the downsides is that these are subcutaneous injections, but there is one oral formulation available. It's called Rybelsis. That's the oral semaglutide, but it is very expensive. Um, so it's even hard to obtain in the VA. You better have a really good reason. So lots of great benefits, right? But again, what are the risks that I, I worry about in my patient population? So the GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, and kind of like a 50-50 diarrhea or constipation. Um, it's really common when you're starting this medication or going up on the dose, and it does tend to improve, but um, we, there's some counseling tips there that you can provide to kind of prevent these effects. Um, that being said, you know, if patients can't tolerate it, this is, you know, we'll stop it. Or um, keeping in mind that because you can get significant weight loss, I wouldn't consider this to be appropriate in someone who is cachectic or had a lower BMI um, because you can see some significant weight loss and then gastroparesis because it's gonna make it worse. Um, I had an awesome question last time I presented on this about what about sarcopenia and are we worried about that? Um, the data is limited, but mostly positive. So there's not really a huge concern about um, the, this drug class causing sarcopenia. If anything, it may be actually a benefit. All right. And then uh, there is some, some risk of uh, gallstones. Um, so if, there, if your patient has signs of gallbladder disease, that's just something to evaluate for. And then very quickly, DPP-4 inhibitors, um, they work very similar to GLP-1s, but they don't affect satiety or appetite and they don't affect gastric emptying. So this becomes a pretty good option when patients don't want a subcutaneous injection because it doesn't have a hypoglycemia risk, it doesn't affect weight. Um, there is one in this class that might increase um, adverse effects for heart failure. So saxagliptin, we just don't tend to use that one in general. Side effects are usually mild, like headache, joint pain, maybe. I would say headache is more common. Um, and then this is a new thing, bullous pem pem pemphigmoid. Sorry, I had to look that up last night. Um, that's a post-market. There's been cases reported. So if you see signs of that, stop this drug. Um, and this is my summary for you. So again, try to avoid drugs with a risk of hypoglycemia if you can. Um, and in patients who have either cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or CKD, we have the GLP-1s and SGLT-2s are great drugs, right? They have great benefits, but again, use with caution or avoid them in specific patient populations. Uh, these are my key points for you. Just don't, I'm not going to say it just out of redundancy, but um, wanted to save the rest of the time for questions. I know I went over a lot of information. It's a very big topic, um, but I hope that I can clarify anything um, if you have any questions. And I can look at the chat as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, there was one uh, comment in the chat um, about that balance between, you know, the cardiovascular and renal benefits of SGLTs, but also, um, you know, uh, balancing with side effects. Yeah. And that's such a, like, I think the balancing act is more prominent with the SGLT2 inhibitors for sure, just because mo just the way it works. I mean, people really feel that increased urinary frequency. Like, I always, I almost hesitate to follow up too quickly, like in two weeks, because they'll be just like, I'm peeing so much. What have you done to me? But 
two weeks later, you know, in a four week follow up, they'll say, yeah, I was peeing a lot and I wasn't sure about this, but eventually it went back down to normal. And I was like, okay, good. So that's typically what happens. Um, but there, there are definitely patients who are like, nope, this hasn't gotten back down to normal. Um, I don't want to take this anymore. And maybe, you know, that's the only thing that would make them pee. So um, additionally, I want to talk about uh, insulin sparing. So we've had studies, um, this is like more of just really new, that GLP-1s are great for slashing insulin doses. Um, I've been pretty successful in getting my older adults off of insulin and replacing it with a GLP-1. Um, definitely harder to do in private practice just because of insurance barriers and costs, but um, that's been a saving grace if they can tolerate. The GLP-1 is just not having to worry about basal bolus insulin. We have a question from Dr. Braun and Olympia. Yeah, just two, two quick uh, points. Um, one is, I, I think we need to be careful, of course, always in geriatric patients of considering variables as dichotomous. Um, and I, I think we hear or feel heart failure and we either check the box or don't check the box, in which case they have to be on the med or, you know, and, and I think that's dangerous. The whole point of what we do is by exactly what you're commenting on is evaluate the risks and potential benefits. I, I had a patient recently who was insulin uh, requiring patient and his postprandial hyperglycemia was not ma well managed by his insulin, but he had a, a low EF on an echocardiogram had never been hospitalized for heart failure, never presented in heart failure. And so people felt that it was absolutely essential to PB on an SGLT2, despite the fact that his blood pressure was 80 over palp when he stood up. And he, he was miserable. So just remember, if you don't control a patient's glycemia, then you're basically giving them an endless loop diuretic. Exactly. That's a great point. Um, and that just reminds me of all of the soft fights I've gotten in <laughs> cardiology. <laughs> um, but yes, so really focusing on like holistic care, looking at the complete patient, not just checking a box. I completely agree. Um, that's why, I mean, dashboards, and, I mean, they're great, they're helpful, but when it comes to geriatrics, it's not that simple. Um, I was just looking at a question. Do you have any advice for comparing the CV benefits between SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs? Um, comparing the CV benefits. So I would reference the, the ADA guidelines. They have a specific chapter on cardiovascular risk management. Um, and they usually go into good detail about which agent in that class has the benefit and what was the benefit. So is it, uh, was it in the primary, uh, primary prevention population? Was it in a secondary prevention population? Um, so if you wanna get into the nitty gritty, there's that chapter and they usually reference also some really awesome systematic reviews that compile all that information for you as well. Great. Well, thank you for answering our questions and for this awesome presentation. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, it's recorded. And so lots more people will be able to see it too. Would you be willing to share your slides with us? You don't have to answer. Oh, questions. yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. So we will um, send the slides out to everyone after the session because I know we will want to reference this over and over. Um, but thank you so much. I know you have to go. Um, so I appreciate the time that you spent with us.